So the main things we've covered so far in this chapter went over what a vector field was in uh, two and three dimensions, went over a square inverse field, um, we went over what a conservative vector field was, went over a test for a conservative, conservative vector field, went over how to find a potential function uh, for a function of, of two or three. Um, variables. We went over how to find the curl of a vector field and then we went over how to find the divergence of a vector field. Alright, and so we're going to start now line integrals. Just a second, pull this up in your textbook. Um, we are going to have to revisit uh, parametric equations and so you might want to uh, review yourself a little bit on the parametric equations uh, to introduce or reintroduce go back into into that uh, we want to talk about piecewise smooth curves Curves. The handwriting is atrocious, I apologize. classic property of gravitational fields is that subject to certain physical constraints the work done by gravity on an object moving between two points in the field is independent of the path taken by the object. One of the constraints is that the path must be a piecewise smooth curve. So we can define a plane curve C as r of t equals x of t times i plus y of t times j where t is of course in between some it's, it has some interval from a to b all right and it's smooth this this uh, plane curve is smooth when dx dt and dy dt are continuous on the interval from a to b. So this right here, that is our plane curve C and is smooth when dx dt and dy dt are continuous on the interval from A to B and not simultaneously zero
on the close on the uh, open interval from A to B. And similarly, in three dimensions, if we have some curve in space and we just add one more component here, we have some z of t times k um, will be smooth <coughs> whenever dx dt, dy dt, and dz dt are continuous. Okay? A curve C is piecewise smooth when the interval can be partitioned into a finite number of subintervals. And so we want to think of those subintervals kind of like uh, different pieces of a graph. Okay? And so you can think about that's where the piecewise comes in, right? A piecewise function is a function with many pieces. So <clears throat> let's look at this figure here. Let me try to make it a little bit larger first. Look at this figure here. Let's find a piecewise smooth parametricization. Say that word a couple times. A piecewise, we're going to find a piecewise. smooth parametricization so if you need a need a new word for your uh, scrabble with friends I don't think you could ever find that many letters and there's no C in there yeah, so uh, parametricization of the graph of C shown in the figure. Alright, so this is going to be a little tough. not something, you know, this is a little different from the norm, not something we normally do here. But let's look at C sub 1, let's look at C sub 2, and let's look at C sub 3. And we want to define our function of x y and z at each one of these so we want to define x of t y of t and z of t <coughs> and I've, I've about run out of room um, but we want to define those say when t is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 1. That's for c sub 1. Then we're going to define those for t greater than or equal to 1, less than or equal to 2.
then we're going to define those where t is greater than or equal to 2, less than or equal to 3. All right, so what we're doing is, since C, this um, curve C consists of C sub 1 plus C sub 2 plus C sub 3, so this whole thing. Start right here, here, to here, to up to here. So that's what C is equal to. It is piecewise smooth. And it, it consists of C sub 1, C sub 2, C sub 3. So we can construct a smooth parametricization for each segment. And then we'll piece them all together by making the last T value in C sub I correspond to the first T value in C sub I plus 1, is the way your book puts it. All right, but we have to be able to define the functions um, at these different times. So when we say these different times, like t equals uh, 0 to 1, that's going to be for c sub 1. And this is c sub 1. And then t equals 1 to 2 is going to be this line. And t equals 2 to 3 is going to be this line. All right, so how does the x change on C sub 1? Um, you might, to get these equations, you might want to think about this point here to this point here. So how does the x change? It doesn't. The x value from this point to this point does not change. So x of t is 0. Now, y of t from here to here, how does the y change? Yeah, it, it changes by 2. So the equation would be 2t. Okay. And then how does the z change from here to here? It doesn't. So again, that's going to be 0, just like the x of t. Now, from this point to this point, how does, and that's for this is c sub 2, how does the x change? So we have t equals 0 here, to t equals 1, to t equals 2, to t equals 3. Okay, so <clears throat> right here the x is 1. Not the x, the t. The t is 1, the x is 0. So if I let x of t be t minus 1, when t is 1, I get x of t equals 0. Right here, when x is 2, that's the end of the interval. What do I want on the x? 1. So if I plug in a 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. So that's why that equation works for c sub 2. Now, here I want y to be equal to 2, and here I want y to be equal to 2. So I want to write down an equation, no matter what you plug in, you always get a 2. Or there's nothing to plug in for. So that would just be y of t equals what? 2. Because there's, it doesn't matter what you plug in between 1 and 2, t equals 1 and 2, you always want to get a 2. Now for z of t, is there a change from here to here? No. So it's just zero.
All right, now, <clears throat> what about this from here to here? What's the change in the x? There's not one. Whatever we plug in, we always want to get a 1. So what would that be? 1. And then is there a change in the y? No. So it needs to be a 2. And then is there a change in the z? All right, now, so we have to be careful because right here, that's when t equals 2. And right here, that's when t equals 3. So if I make this t minus 2, let's see what happens. So right here, when t is 2, I'd have t minus t and get 0. That's good. And right here, when t equals 3, I'd have 3 minus 2 is 1 and get a 1. Okay. So we have three sets of symmetric equations. Not symmetric, but parametric equations. We have parametric equations for c sub 1, for c sub 2, and c sub 3. So now we can define a piecewise function c That's going to be r of t. Remember, r of t is equal to x of t i plus y of t j plus z of t k. So I'm going to define my r of t as um, sum, sum up x of t i, so 0i plus 2tj plus 0k. That's going to be when t is greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 1. Okay. Then, let's do the same thing for c sub 2. Let's sum these equations up. So, this will be t minus 1 i plus 2 j and then plus 0 k. And that's when t is greater than or equal to 1, less than or equal to 2. All right. And then sum up these last ones here. So I'm going to have 1i plus 2j plus t minus 2k when t is greater than or equal to 2, less than or equal to 3. Now, since c sub 1, c sub 2, and c sub 3 are smooth, that means that c will also be smooth. Just a little different way to think about things um, in the real world. Remember, there's always lots of conditions, especially with time. As time changes, things change a lot. And so to define very complex models, as time changes, we have to be able to define those using parametric equations, which then we can convert over to piecewise functions to give us something we can work with at different times. Mm -hmm. Okay, back at the top, when you got um, you know, t equals 2 and t equals 3, where did that go? Um, <clears throat> remember, with parametric equations, we, we graph, we would, if we were given the parametric equations and we wanted to, to graph the function, then we say we would have when t equals 1, when t equals 2, when t equals 3, and then we would denote that by which way it was going by an arrow and so when you graph this point that's when t equals 0 when you graph this point that's when t equals 1 when you graph this point that's t equals 2 so and when you graph this be. point it's t equals 3 so yeah I mean the, each point has to be for a different t so it would always be in order like it would always go to 0, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3. yeah with, 
you know, and it would depend on the arrows. The arrows tell you that oh, it get, it's yeah. going in this direction. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see those arrows there. All right. <clears throat> so up to this point in calculus, whenever you see something like this, That's just a single integral, and you integrate over some interval from A to B. Just a regular old run-of-the-mill, integrate the function over the interval from A to B. That's a definite integral. All right. So then we moved on, and we got into double or triple integrals, where we would integrate a function in two or three variables over some region R or over some space Q. And so, you know, we would just integrate over some region, figure out the boundaries, and be done. All right, well, we can also integrate over some curve C. So, like this up here, where C was equal to this function, we can integrate over C. As long as we have a piecewise smooth curve. So, I'll write that to the side since this is something new. Integrate. over a piecewise smooth curve C. Why are we calling it a piecewise smooth curve when the other one was a triangle? The actual graph of it was a triangle. This looking thing. This? It's because it's continuous on all parts. And on any part, it's not simultaneously zero. That's why we call it a smooth curve, a piecewise smooth curve. So it's continuous on some interval from A to B. And each part is continuous. The X, the Y, the Z are all continuous. There's And at no part, is it is any or all three of those components equal to zero all right so to introduce the concept of a line integral consider the mass of a wire of finite length given by a curve C in space its density mass per unit length of the wire at point XYZ is given by the function F at XYZ. And partition the curve C into points so that it looks something like this. So we're thinking about a wire maybe in space Right, and um, let's partition or break up that wire into points P sub O, P sub 1, P sub 2, P sub I minus 1, P sub I, P sub N minus 1, all the way to P sub N.
So then, if that goes all the way to p sub n, we would have n sub arcs. So we have one big arc by partition, partitioning this thing into many pieces we would have all the way to p sub n that would create n sub arcs. So we partition the curve C into n sub arcs. The length of the ith sub arc is given by delta S sub I. So this right here, this length of the ith sub arc is delta s sub i. That's the change there, the length. So next, choose a point x sub i, y sub i, z sub i in each sub arc. All right. If the length of each sub arc is small, then the total mass of the wire can be approximated. The mass of the wire can be approximated by summing up all of the pieces. I equals 1 to n of f of x sub i, y sub i, z sub i, times delta s sub i. Okay, by letting the magnitude of delta denote the length of the longest sub arc and letting the magnitude of delta approach zero the limit of this sum approaches the mass of the wire. All right, so we can think about the definition of a line integral in this way to kind of help it make a little more sense as it's a wire with density and we're figuring out the mass. So, which brings us to the definition of a line integral, the official definition. <coughs> All right. If F is defined in a region containing a smooth curve C a 
a finite length, so measurable length, then the line integral of f along c is given by the integral of f of x, y, d, s on C will be the same thing as the limit as the magnitude or the change that delta approaches zero of the sum I equals one to N of F of X sub I Y sub I times delta S sub I So of course that's just in two dimensions. That would be in the plane. Same thing in three dimensions. Just we have one more component. So that's equal to the limit as the magnitude of delta approaches zero. Uh, sum I equals 1 to N F of X sub I Y sub I Z sub I times delta S sub I and that would be in space three dimensions provided that this limit actually exists Um, the evaluation of the line integral is best accomplished by converting it to a definite integral. So how do we do that? How do we convert that to a definite integral? Evaluation of a line integral as a definite integral. So let F be continuous in a region containing a smooth curve C. So if uh, C is given by no, not equals means basically the same thing but is given by r of t equals x of t i plus y of t j where a um, or t is greater than or equal to a, less than or equal to b, then the line integral is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x of t, y of t, times the square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared dt. Of course, if this c is given in, in three dimensions, So if it's r of t equals x of t i plus y of t j plus z of t k, 
where T is between A and B. Then the line integral in three dimensions is the integral from A to B of F of X of T, Y of T, Z of T times the square root of the derivative of x of t squared <coughs> plus the derivative of y of t squared plus the derivative of z of t squared. dt. This is a little note that your book has, must be important. It says, note that if f of x, y, z equals 1, then the line integral gives the arc length of the curve C as defined in section 12.5 or the integral of C of 1 ds is equal to the integral from A to B of the magnitude of R prime of T dt Right, because if the function is 1, all this right here is 1, then this right here, the square root of these squared, that's the magnitude of the derivative of r of t. And that's how you find the magnitude of the derivative of r of t. So that's just the length of the curve c, arc length. All right, and that's it for today. We'll work a few examples on Friday.